So today we're going to talk about men and commitment. So I have a question for you, Marie. You occasionally overhear my coaching calls. What's the one consistent thing you hear from the women kind of in the background when I'm talking to them? Um, Non-committal. Not non-committal men. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of men at midlife are non-committal. Did you ever experience a non-committal man? Yes. Okay. Yes. So today we're going to talk about what it, what the number one reason men suddenly commit. But um, today, before we dive into that, I want to talk about commitment though, because I think at midlife commitment's a lot different than when you're in your 20s and 30s. So I always say that when you're in your 20s and 30s, if you're a man, if you're genuinely seeking to um, make have babies and start a family with someone, then a man is looking for a wife. And when he's looking for a wife, he's you know considering the process differently than if he's not looking for a wife. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Okay. So when you got married, was your husband looking for, your now ex-husband, was he looking for a wife? Oh, yeah. Okay. Talk about that for a second. About my husband looking for a wife? Well, I just meant you came from a culture that, you know, like you're both Colombian and he was looking for a wife. I I fit the profile. Okay. You fit the profile. <laughs> and you know, it's funny. Uh, yesterday, uh, Marie met my ex-wife. Sadly, we had to go to a funeral for a mutual friend of ours. And and the same thing was with me. You know, she fit the profile because I was looking for someone to start a family with and she fit the profile. I think in midlife, it's a much harder to even ascertain what the profile is because we come to the table. Some people call it baggage. I like to call it luggage with, you know, children, our professional life, mm -hmm. and there's alimony and child support and visitation rights, and family court. You know, it's really a stew of complication. And so I think for many men and women, it's hard to know what commitment looks like at midlife. I agree. Okay. So. Yeah. Um, well, what about your title? Your title says about men that commit suddenly. Well, you know, it's interesting. So uh, a, a client recently shared something with me and, but, uh, and this isn't the first time this happened. I mean, I probably have heard the exact same story dozens of times is why do men that I've dated suddenly marry the next person that they're with? You want my opinion? Oh, sure. I wasn't expecting it, but I'd like your opinion. Well, she wasn't the one. Okay. She wasn't the one, but what made these women all of a sudden the one? Because they were ready. Ah, these the, men were. Or there was something else there. There was that spark. There was a, there was something different. Well, so I want to lean into what you just said. They were ready because one of the fundamentals men need to commit, whether it's suddenly or not, is they have to want commitment. So I don't think it's a sudden thing. No. I don't believe in sudden commitment. It's No. In fact, uh, you know, even though the title is about suddenly, it really starts with a man desiring commitment before he ever meets the person. But do some men meet a person and they think, they say, well, I'm not ready to commit. And then they meet the next person. They're like, wow this is someone I want to commit to. So that's a good point. And why, and that's actually what I want to address today, because in many cases, especially right after divorce, I want to tell a quick story to everyone. Right after my divorce, I started online dating. And I remember five months in, I met the, I saw this woman's profile and I thought, oh my God, she's gorgeous. I'd like to meet her. Of course, most men operate from if they're attracted to her, they want to meet her kind of thing. Yeah. And she wrote me back, how long have you been divorced? And I said, I've been separated for five months. And she wrote me back, reach out to me 18 to 24 months after your divorce. And when you've had one to two transition girlfriends. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, it's interesting. I said to her, I go, no, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. And. Sure enough, a few months later, I meet a woman. I told you about the pharmaceutical rep. Right. And we're three months into the relationship. And I said, oh, my God, I'm not ready for a serious relationship. And she was my first of many transitional girlfriends. Wasn't it five years worth? Well, before I met my significant first significant relationship after my divorce, it was about five years. Yeah. And my point is, 
you know, in many cases, the woman that that man is with that chooses the next woman suddenly, it's because that woman, unbeknownst to her, was preparing him for the next woman. That relationship was kind of a launching pad. Well, that sucks. Yeah, it sucks to be in that position of transition, girlfriend. It's one of the reasons why in my private coaching, by the way, there's a link, right? You see this? Can you point at it? I can't. I have to go. It's, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> so uh, in my private coaching, I teach you how to vet for emotional maturity. I teach you how to ask the right questions to determine, are you going to be just another transition girlfriend in this man's life? Or is he ready? Because it's not... Okay, it's not about suddenly being ready, okay? That doesn't happen. Now, with what you did say, there are men that start off casual and that relationship can develop into something more serious. The problem is nine out of 10 times, the men who say they want something casual, they want no pressure, nine out of 10 times or maybe 99 out of 100 times, it's not going to turn into anything serious. But that's what women bank on. Okay. Do you want to elaborate on that? Well, a lot of women think that, you know, even though he says it's casual, we're going to keep it casual. We're going to keep it casual. But once he really gets to know me, he's going to want to be with me. Yeah. And, and that's where I find it really sad because you waste a lot of your time on somebody that's not going to commit to you. Well, the other thing I think that happens is women are feeling like the, because they've invested time, they, the, men, the men start to act in poor behavior, their behavior starts mm. to disintegrate, and they have they begin to start doubling down on that man. In other words, I've got so much invested, I, if I, I can't let this one go because I have too much invested. It's like mm. when we were gambling that one time on the cruise ship, and you're like, I thought you should quit, you know, cut your <laughs> losses. You're like, no, I've lost too much, I gotta win it back kind of thing. And I think a lot of women, do this and they accept bad behavior from men when they should just cut their losses. You seem like you have something you want to say. No, I wasn't losing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. That no, no, I made money yeah, and then I was, started to lose. I anyway. Started. Okay. So coming back to, you know, it's interesting when I was preparing for our video today, I actually typed in why men suddenly commit. Mm -hmm. And a friend of ours, a mutual friend of ours, actual a quote that he had written came up on the internet. And I'd like to share it with you. It's okay. from uh, Trip Kramer. Trip Kramer is the man who uh, married Megan. And I was the officiant at the wedding. And I came to Chicago for this wedding. Right. And that's where we met. So Trip Kramer wrote the following. He said, a man will commit when he feels a deep connection with a woman that he doesn't feel with anyone else, when he finds a lover who is also his best friend that makes him feel special and unique. And I felt like that was so perfectly worded when there's a deep connection. So do you remember on your dating profile what yes, you wrote? I do. <laughs> okay. You didn't, you weren't prepared for this. So no, I, I, no. Okay. What did you say in your dating profile? I said, I want a deeply connected relationship. Um, something like this that would lead to mutual trust and admiration. Okay. And so when you read my profile, what was your thoughts about just even the essay of the profile? Well, I, I thought what you wrote matched what I was looking for. Okay. So here's the thing about deep connection. I think deep connection can be very confusing to people. What is deep connection? Because these days, I believe most people have surface conversations and not deeper conversations of vulnerability. I'm sharing from notes. So surface conversations. How's your day going? Did you have a good day? I hope you had a good day. That's my line from Kramer. In fact, you were you had dated a man. I dated someone that, you know, twice a day. It was the good morning and then the how'd your day go? What do you do? What do you do all day? And so that really that that brief encounter never materialized because it was a surface mm -hmm. relationship. Now, here's the thing about deeper conversations and vulnerability. Women actually get tricked by something that happens with men. And I want to talk about this before we go into a deeper aspect of this, because um, 
men who share their problems, particularly about their past relationship or their marriage, it seems like a deep conversation. It seems like vulnerability. Do you know where I'm going with this? Yes. Do you know who I'm talking about? Not exactly. Oh, hang on. Oh, the oh. H word. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you two connected with each other and he shared the problems in his marriage, right? Right. Okay. It went both ways. Yeah. You shared about the problems with your marriage. Right. And in that, the two of you thought, and I mean, to some degree, even though the relationship was a, a strong relationship at one point, I think you bonded in that trauma, but that wasn't true vulnerability. That was just sharing your problems. Why I'm saying this to everyone is in some ways you were his therapist for a while. Yeah, he was mine too. Okay, so you were each <laughs> other's therapist. A lot of women find themselves thinking that there's true vulnerability being built with a man when you're sharing your mutual problems or he's leading with his problems in his past marriage. And what happens for a lot of women, they turn into the therapist. Yeah, I've seen that a lot. Yeah. When I think of some of my friends, not I didn't see it in myself, obviously, because you know, I would have stopped at it that at that time had I had I healed and known more. Uh, but but I see a lot of friends that um, they find men that I, I just call them fixer uppers that they think they're going to fix them. Yeah. Yeah. They're wounded warriors. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's it's actually a very admirable thing to do to be a support person. However, what happens in many cases is that they become the therapist for this man. OK. And then when he's healed, he ends the relationship because he's already been vulnerable in a weak capacity. Mm -hmm. And he goes and finds someone new that he becomes the bright, shiny penny. So in those cases of clients and other women I've right. spoken to where, why did he marry the next man? It's because most likely you operated unbeknownst to yourself as his therapist. The woman. Next the woman. woman. The next Yeah. He finds the next woman is because the previous woman was literally his therapist. Now, why do I say therapist? Because men oftentimes don't speak to other men about their problems. We avoid conversations with our male friends and it's so much more comfortable to talk to a woman because women are more nurturing, they're more compassionate, they're more sensitive. So I wanna talk about shifting the conversations from those men that talk about their unhappy marriage to the real conversation that leads to intimacy. And that is when you talk about your fears, you talk about your shame, your judgment, and guilt. So do you remember when we were dating and I talked about Connor? Yes. Okay, folks, if you're not aware of this, um, I lost my 19-year-old son almost five years ago to an accident. And obviously, that's anyone who's a parent right now knows that that's our, the scariest thing that can happen in our lives. And in my particular case, I shared with you the shame I felt around that, the guilt I felt, felt around that, even the anger I felt around that. That was me being as vulnerable mm -hmm. and authentic and transparent. Okay, so do you see the difference between sharing problems about your marriage versus talking about a real place of shame, of fear? I mean, didn't that build trust between us? Of course it did. Okay, and what, what does trust do for two people? What does trust do for two people? Yeah, when it's, two people can it actually... creates intimacy. Yeah. yeah. Intimacy creates trust. Trust builds more intimacy. But intimacy is built through sharing your fears, your insecurities. I mean, it includes your joys. But even like, what was I talking to you about the other day? The judgment I had over someone? <laughs> I don't remember. Okay. Um, I can't remember now. But I these are things... We, we talk about that builds intimacy. Okay, so where does this relate to commitment? Well, ultimately commitment is built not through the good times and it's not built by using someone as your therapist. Intimacy is built in the capacity to be vulnerable and more importantly, ready, being ready for a relationship. So 
Um, and it requires desiring a life partner too. So just to take a rewind here, I went through a divorce almost 15 years ago. I was a train wreck for a long time. And then I met someone and I was in a relationship with her for on and off for six years. And while there, it was a good relationship, it still wasn't the right relationship. I hate to say it, we were each other's training wheels for our now significant relationship. Hmm. And I think that what happens in this case where men suddenly commit, oftentimes in the new person, is because the person that they were with was kind of their training ground. Yeah. And I mean, did you ever feel that with men that you dated that you were their training ground to some degree? No, I didn't. Other, you know, my significant relationship, yes, we bonded in our both traumas. We were both getting out of a divorce. As a matter of fact, our divorces were final on the same day. So it was? It was. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> it was divorce. Our divorce was on the same day. Um, so, you know, yeah, I learned a lot. <laughs> and even after that significant relationship, you went to the naked divorce, by the way, folks, uh, check out something, the naked divorce.com or naked recovery .com. Ask for Adele mention both our names. Okay. Cause you went through this program I that really that. helped you heal. Yes. And okay. Adele also offers a clarity call. So you can actually talk to her and she can explain to you what, you know, if you're a right fit. Um, but it was great for me. So can someone in the chat box write nakeddivorce.com or nakedrecovery.com and please ask for Adele and include both our names. Because while you did the naked divorce, naked recovery to heal, I went to the Hoffman process after my significant relationship ended to really heal my childhood wounds, my traumas, my adult relationship issues that prepared me to be ready because the reality is, is men don't suddenly commit. Okay. They have to be prepared to commit. They have to want to be intentional. And at the same time, like what, you know, what Tripp said, when we feel a deep connection with someone and deep connection doesn't come without being vulnerable, authentic, and transparent. And most of you, I'm sorry to say, are having surface conversations with men. The, you know, the highlight of your day is, how's your day going? Did you have a good day? I hope you had a good day. And I'm intentionally, you know, um, a little bit comical when I say it because true intimacy comes through deeper connection. And connection has nothing to do with sex. Oh, good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. What's your favorite thing to do in the morning? Coffee. We have morning coffee on the couch. Okay. And today we had a rough conversation. We did. We did. We were well, talking about some, well, it was depressing. Well, it was depressing because we had been to this funeral the day before. So it, it just kind of, you know. But yet it was raw. It was authentic. It was mm -hmm. transparent. We talked about our fears related to aging and we've been watching the show called The Resident. So, and it's all about traumas in the ER type of thing. The whole world has to know what show we're watching. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to watch The Bachelor tonight. <laughs> I got to find out what happens to Zach. Uh, <laughs> I'm rooting for Ariel, by the way. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't mind. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So anyway, coming back to it, the bottom line is this, ladies, if I've learned one thing, men don't suddenly commit. They have to want a life partner first and foremost. Number two, they have to be in a state of readiness. And number three, there has to be a deep connection built between the two of you. And the only way to get there is through vulnerability, authenticity, and transparency. And one of the reasons why my clients beat the odds, because let me tell you something, dating sucks and the odds are against you. Why do my clients have success? Because they know to cut to the jugular. They lay the rules of, they lay their cards on the table through radical honesty early. It eliminates a lot of the wrong guys, but what happens is to this, the cream rises to the top and that's what I help teach you all. So Check out the link below to a discovery call with me. If you can't afford coaching, check out my group called Midlife Love Mastery. Check out all the books I recommend, including my book, What the Heck is Self-Love Anyway? A Journey of Personal Development, Self-Help, and Spiritual Work. All right, links below. We're going to do Q&A. Okay, first I have to say something. Okay. 
Okay, so you all know that I don't do this for a living. I've never been on camera before. And um, sometimes, you know, doing, he doesn't give me any notes. I don't know what his, his topic is going to be. We just sit here and just make So do happen. I really cut you off? Well, we get a lot of people saying that he cuts me off. But the truth is, I have to think about what I'm going to say because, you know, this is kind of scary that I might <laughs> say the wrong thing, you know? So I, you know, sometimes I think and I'm like a deer in headlights. And so he, you know, he jumps in. So I don't feel that he cuts me off. Okay. And if he does cut me off, then I'll be hitting his leg. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If today I feel you feel like you cut off or something you want to say, no. hit my leg. Okay. No. <laughs> All right. So I, well, I'm glad you cleared that up because I've been a little bit annoyed because when we talk, we probably cut each other off most of the time. <laughs> well, we do because we all, we both have more to say than the other. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, all right, we're gonna take questions right now. For those who know my format, if you have a question, write the word question in the chat box um, and post the question or purchase a super sticker, super chat. There's a dollar sign. If you're watching the replay, you can hit the super thanks. Um, all the monies from the super sticker, super chats goes to a scholarship fund in the name of my son, Connor Asley. That's a picture of him right there in the Obey shirt. He's my son who passed away five years, ago, almost five years ago. And in his honor, we donate to causes like the Hoffman Process and Insight Institute. And I'll be donating some money to my friend who lost his son recently as well. So to the charity that they uh, choose. So uh, again, purchase the super sticker, super chat. And write the word question so it's easier for fine. By the way, there is a spoiler alert. Someone just posted Ariel didn't went home. So we haven't watched it yet. We were going to watch it tonight because it doesn't show up till Hulu later. Yeah, I so. Googled it. Oh, you Googled it? <laughs> well, don't tell me. I don't want to know who won. Okay. All right. So let's see if we have any questions. Um, Linda writes, Marie, how can you say connection has nothing to do with sex? Okay, that's a good question. Emo well, it is. But for me, emotional connection is much more important um, before you get to the sexual part of it. You know, that's just me. So I, and I, I think that's a very valid question, Linda. So I appreciate you brought that up. Sex. So when we think of intimacy, we can think of emotional intimacy and physical intimacy. And there's no doubt sex is an integral part of a relationship. In fact, what did I say in my notes? I said something, your best friend who you have regular sex, sex with. Okay. Uh, right. But when you're just meeting somebody, if you're going to start having deep connection with, you're not. At, for me, at that point, I wouldn't even be thinking about sex. I, I, is this somebody that I would even want to consider pursuing a relationship yeah. with? And then ultimately, I think a lot of this, what I'm about to say, I've heard from so many men, they can have sex with women and feel no emotional connection with them. Mm -hmm. It's the women that they actually feel emotional connection with them mm -hmm. while they're having sex are the ones that they want to commit to. So, mm -hmm. and that was built like what you're talking about prior to having sex, building that emotional connection. So then when you are having sex with them, like, and that's how I feel with us. I feel this over, overwhelming sense of connection mm -hmm. because it was built before, you know. Because we, it wasn't just sex. It wasn't just <laughs> sex, exactly. So uh, Linda, that was a great question. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, all right, let's see what we have. Vera says, uh, you're a sweetheart and you're doing a great job. We love you to have right next to Jonathan, your gorgeous couple, by the way. Oh, Aww, thank you so thank much. You. We appreciate that. Melanie That's says, sweet. Marie, you have a strong energy. Do not think she would anyone do, do not think she would anyone let anyone, anyone cut her off. Cut her okay. Off. Thanks so much. All right. <laughs> Ah, Denise quickly said she is saying that these are independent from using sex as a way to get connection. Exactly. 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 That's a great point. Great, great way of putting it. Yeah. So, um, all right, here we go. Kathleen writes question. I've dated a guy for six months. When we are having a disagreement, he diminishes my feelings and can't say he's sorry. Anything I can do to help him understand that the importance of apologizing. 
Actually, I want to hear what you have. To, do you have something to say on this? Um, because you're really somebody, good. You're really good at communicating. That, okay, somebody that can't own it, or and an apology isn't. I'm sorry you feel that way. Yeah, I can't stand that people say, "I'm sorry you feel that way." Um, that's not an apology. No, I'm so glad you said. Um, that. <laughs> an apology is. I didn't realize you felt that way. I'm. I'm sorry about that. I, you know, I'll try better. I'll, you know, I really do. I don't about, know how to, how to make someone do that. Yeah. Way. You know, it's interesting. I, I think you it might start by saying, I don't feel heard, mm -hmm. you know, in this particular instant, but you're right. If a person can't, this is really tricky because coming back to this question, um, I want to point out something. Um, uh, wait, where is it again? Uh, dating him for six months. Uh, he diminishes my feelings. So right off the bat, you know, your feelings are your own. Your, your yeah. feelings cannot be diminished. Okay. So uh, when someone but, does that. But he's being dismissive. Of being dismissive of the feelings. So, you know, I think standing up for yourself is my feelings are true for me. If he discounts your feelings, diminishes your feelings, and then can't take ownership, this is borderline narcissistic behavior. That's a gaslighting behavior and certainly a person that doesn't have empathy for your feelings. Let me ask you a question, Kathleen. Do you feel happy in this relationship? You know, um, is there, because this is only going to get worse. And ultimately, I think it's about sharing how you feel exactly and asking for a, I would ask for a coach, a counselor, or someone to mutually, you got something to say. You're tapping my leg, so you have no. something to say. Well, I, <laughs> I think if you stay with somebody that's be, that's treating you that way, you're settling. You're settling yeah. for, for less than you deserve. Um, if he isn't willing to listen to you and, and at least try to understand your point of view and, and how it makes you feel, you can't. Feelings are feelings. Nobody can tell you you can't, you shouldn't feel that way. It's how you feel. So, you know, you're the one that's going to have to decide if if he's not somebody that's willing to do it, do that, or go with you to see a therapist. But I you know I get the feeling that yeah. a lot of men that are like that think that a therapist isn't going to tell them anything they don't already know. Yeah. And, and that mm -hmm. rarely does work. And most likely, well, you know what she could do is start doing some really jackass things to him, diminish his feelings when he brings it up and never apologize when she's actually done something. And I'm being tongue in cheek here. <laughs> um, you know, this is a challenge. You can't change someone. It's, I mean, you can simply express how you feel. And if he continually diminishes your feelings, ask yourself, is this the person I want to be with? Now, if he loves you, if he truly loves you, he's going to listen to you. He's going to, he's going to try to make adjustments to make you feel loved. Because yeah. basically when someone does that, it doesn't make you feel loved. So, and you know what, this thing about men not going to therapy, I think that's bullshit. You know, I'm here to say if, you know, very few people are good at relationship. I can bet you anything. He's got a string of past relationships that didn't work out. And he doesn't recognize that he is the common denominator in his past relationships. Um, anyone who's unwilling to seek help to improve something is a person that isn't genuinely serious about wanting something substantial. That's just my two cents anyway. No comment? No comment. Okay. <laughs> you don't want to, we, we don't have to belabor this. Speak your truth, do it in a kind way. And if he doesn't uh, appreciate you, then you have to ask yourself, is this the right person for you? Kathleen, thank you so much for that question. Jennifer or, or Isabel wrote, how do you deal with mummy's boys and interfering mothers? <laughs> Were so, you ever a mama's boy? Were your boys no. mama's boy? Were you an inter interfering mom to no. your? Okay. No, but, but I've seen that. In fact, there's a, I think there's a reality show on mama's boys. Oh, that's something. right. On, on, uh, on, in Hulu, on Hulu, there's a, uh, there's mama's boys. Um, how do you deal with that? You know what? You're anyone. Well, 
it kind of goes back to the covert incest we talked about before. Mm -hmm. Any and covert. By the way, if you're not familiar with what's called covert incest, this is many cases where a typically it's a father daughter mother son where the mother to the son is the 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 mother either the mother's emotional support system or the son's emotional support system and the, this works uh, the same way with uh, men and their daughters their actual relationship is almost it's not true incest it's not sexual no, incest it's, it's emotional incest, incest. Yeah. and oftentimes those people need to be separated from one another to ever have a chance Right. That's something that really, you know, I, I experienced something similar and it really makes it a relationship difficult when you're not the number one person because you find out what's going on in his life while he's talking to his daughter. And it's like, no, this is not the way it's supposed to go. So, if you're not the pri emotional priority in the relationship, the mother, in this case for the son, is the mother's the emotional priority, or in the case of a daughter, where the father is an emotional priority, you're competing with someone who most likely won't put you at that same level of importance. And I would very, it's it's hard to deal with that. And um, I believe the problem is not his mother. The problem is him. Hmm. He's the one that has to give you your place. And and if he doesn't, then you're going to have that problem for the rest of your yeah. life. It's what did they say in uh, Forrest Gump? Run, Forrest, run. <laughs> I'd run from those guys. OK. OK. Uh, thank you so much. Jennifer writes, I, I agree with Marie about emotional connection is so important. I've been with men in the past and have had no emotional connection. Thank you for sharing that. Catherine writes the following question. What discussion topics do you think have most helped the two of make, a, I'm assuming the two of us make a, dick, a deep connection, a dick connection, a Just, deep connection? Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Important top. So Jonathan, when, you know, some of you may know that when I first met him, I, it's like he asked a lot of questions, a lot of questions that I'd never experienced a person like that. And I even told my daughter, this guy's exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to unpack everything. Um, so it was a little, it was just, what we talked about everything. Well, we talked I, about finance. We talked about our kids. We talked about past, our past previous relationships. relationships. We talked about um, what we're looking for. We talked um, about sex. <laughs> I'm a guy. I want to be, let's, let's not, I mean, I'm, I want to be real here. We talked about a lot of deep things. Um, most of it was centered from the beginning. It was centered around our past relationships and the wounds we experienced from our past relationships and the recovery of those wounds from our past relationships. So we talked about, you know, I told him I had gone to naked divorce. I taught, I told him a lot of things that I had done that I had never talked to anybody before. Um, I, gosh, I had like with um, the professor, he, um, I never okay. talked to him about that. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Like I, I think back, I never had those conversations. Why? Because I just didn't really think that that relationship was going to go anywhere. So what, I've observed in some of your past dating experiences and certainly my own was in many cases, some of them were just surface relationships that COVID in particular it was caused us to choose some people for the companionship, but not the deep connection. I think right. there was this overall desperate feeling going on for a period of time, at least for myself, I think you felt the same yeah. way. Well, I had a relationship. It was a great relationship. I, it was just not deep. And I knew it wasn't deep, but. It was a placeholder. <laughs> and I mean, no disrespect, but in many of, and by the way, a lot of you ladies, you're in what I call placeholder relationships. You know, the men. So if you want to break that pattern of being a placeholder, of being that, you know, the transition girlfriend and he suddenly finds the next person to commit to, it starts with radical honesty, deep, vulnerable conversations. So um, did we, I hope we answered your question. The topics, I, I think we already addressed as well. So yeah. Catherine, thank you so much for that. We really appreciate it. Uh, 
Let's see. Up, 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 up. Oh, here's one. And again, write the word question before you write, post the question. I didn't feel much connection with a guy for eight months, but after this, there was sexual and emotional connection. Is this normal? We both are people who take a long time to put our guards down. So I, I think, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think some people just take, yeah, take time. The challenge with time though, and I'm not against it, is wasting time. You know, yeah, the in, question is, how do you know that it's going to get to that point? Yeah. And, um, and so I think some women bet if I keep, if, he, if I just show him, how, and I'm not suggesting about you, Lindy, um, but with many women, they think if I can just show him how great I am, he will want to commit. And so coming back to this, I didn't feel much connection. Well, I hear there was some connection. So let's differentiate between no connection and some connection. If there is connection there, yes, that can be built and grow upon with each other. That's absolutely true. At the same time, you could be betting in a fixer upper and, mm -hmm. you know, like what was that movie with Tom Hanks, the, 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 the house that uh, was a disaster, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, be careful investing in a, a broken down house, so to speak. So, all right, let's keep going. Uh, bump, 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 bump. Oh, here we go. Thank you, uh, Rabbit Heart uh, from the 999 Super Sticker question. Any tips for connecting deep with a man that has an avoidant attachment style? We are compatible, to, but it seems like steps forward and then back. So um, if you're not familiar with the work of Amir Levine, Rachel Heller, by the way, I'll pull a copy of the book. The book is, anyone who's watching, the book is called Attached. Oh, let's see. Okay, Amat, uh, uh, Amir Levine, Rachel Heller. This talks about the three different type attachment styles. There is known as anxious, avoidant, and secure. Anxious people are top, typically your needy people. They're very anxiety-based uh, in relationship. I'm a little bit anxious. Um uh, avoid. What am I? Wait, what am I? Well, I think your default is a little bit avoidant. I think we're both secure now in our lives, but my I default the is test a, and I'm, a, I'm you're, secure. Yeah, everybody is secure when they take the test because they don't answer it properly. But I think <laughs> you are as close to being secure as possible. But to answer your question about avoidance, avoidance fear love deeply. Anxious people desperately need love. Avoidance are afraid to love. And yet at the same time, they deeply want to be loved. So how do you, so the importance with these relationships with an avoidant, if there is a true connection there, is to keep building upon it over time, okay? It's going to require demonstrating trust with one another. It's going to demonstrate being vulnerable, authentic, and transparent with one another. And it's going to most likely need some storms. And what I mean by storms is there's going to be little fights that may occur. In those little fights, these are known as threshold barriers. If you continually overcome a threshold barrier and another threshold barrier and another threshold, he will begin to feel safer in the relationship. That's one way. Or he's most likely going to need a traumatic event a humbling event to shift them. I oftentimes, in the previous videos, I talk about the movie um, Officer and a Gentleman. Uh, Richard Gere is the quintessential avoidant man in this relationship, right? Does anyone remember the movie Officer and a Gentleman? Richard Gere, young Richard Gere was an avoidant. It took his best friend committing suicide for him to shift. So, it's either going to take, as I said before, building trust through these threshold barriers or an absolute humbling event. The problem with an immediate humbling event, the, it's unlike the movie, you know, he shifted automatically. It could take time for that. So he's got to heal from that. Yeah, he's got to heal from that. And so, but those are usually the two ways an avoidant shifts more into a secure is building trust. Okay. <laughs> well, I want to make sure I'm not cutting you off. Like everybody <laughs> thinks I cut you off. So I want to, uh, let's keep going. I know we had another, uh, we had another $10. I just want to say, Denise says, thank you for the $10 super sticker, Denise. We appreciate, love this conversation. We appreciate that so much. 
All right, let's keep swimming. <laughs> Michelle says, actually, after you watch The Bachelor, I'm curious on your and Marie thoughts about what Zach does. Well, again, we haven't seen it, but we know it's sex week. <laughs> you know, folks, I typically don't like reality TV. And yet I'm interested in these reality TV shows because I believe it's a microcosm into human behavior, particularly in romantic relationships. So this is actually fodder for me to watch these things. But I am addicted to it. And I did have a crush on Ariel. I'm bummed. She got bumped. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, the reality TV also you're dealing with some people that you're coaching that go through these things. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm glad so, you brought that up. Yeah. By the way, the reason why I liked Ariel, she's, she reminds me of you. She has she's very boys. Yeah. yeah. She's boy. She's yeah. classy. And by the way, you have a crush on that doctor from the resident anyway. So no, not though yeah. no, from the good doctor. Um, Melendez. Right. Oh, <laughs> All right. Anyway. Um, Jasmine says, oh, going back to what's so true, Jonathan, about therapy. Exactly. Thank you. All right, let's keep swimming here. Melanie writes, question. We got engaged after 10 months, had an argument, alcohol, two months engaged. Should we continue now that he's taken the initiative and getting counseling? Well, alcohol-related arguments, first off, alcohol, <laughs> alcohol, can be the death or success of a, some relationships. And I'm joking about the success part. Um, I think if he's taking initiative and getting counseling, that's a great sign. Yeah. You know, someone who's willing to make effort, that's a great sign. So, you know, arguments are going to happen. Conflict resolution is an imperative skill for a, for a significant relationship. So, Melanie, I think in this case, if he's willing to do work, that's a great sign for the both of you. While that can't be a guaranteed you know, success, it's certainly a lot better than people that don't make the yeah, effort. It's a start. And yeah. you guys are engaged for a reason. So I would give it a chance. Okay. All right. I, uh, let's see. Here we go. Eva writes, question. What can you do if you feel as though your partner has intimacy and anxiety? And anorexia? Has, oh, intimacy anorexia. Have you ever heard of this? And it's also, and if so, have how have couples overcome that? So intimacy anorexia, emotional constipation. You know. I've never heard those things. Well, okay, think of anorexia. It's getting skinny. It's it's uh, you know, it's it's eliminating. So, um so they're avoiding sex? Is that no, it? avoiding, in, well, it could be, uh, I'm assuming intimacy. emotional intimacy, intimacy mm -hmm. as opposed to physical intimacy. Um, I haven't heard it, but I'm familiar with it. What can you do to overcome this? Check out the book. Okay. I like Barbara DeAngelis' work, okay? She wrote a book, How to Make Love All the Time. It's pretty thick. OK, um, I definitely recommend. By the way, all the books I recommend are in the description below. What I like about her book, it's all designed to build emotional intimacy with your partner. One of the things I do in my private coaching, what do I do is help create the conversations to build emotional intimacy. How does this happen? Being vulnerable, being authentic, being transparent, overwhelming the person so they they get exhausted. <laughs> you didn't run away, even though I exhausted you. Well, because, you know, I wanted somebody deep. It was just when you get, you, know, you put it out in the universe and then you get someone like really deep and you go, wow. Yeah, I'm okay. not I'm not the eight foot pool. I'm the Marianas <laughs> trenches of deep, you know, I'm eight miles below the water. You know, so my point is intimacy is built through vulnerability, authenticity and transparency. Check out this book. You know, read the other books I recommend, like Emotional Intimacy by Robert Masters. Check out the book I Hear You by Michael Sorensen. Again, in the description below is a Jonathan recommended reading list. I highly recommend those books. Um, okay, let's keep swimming here. Bah, bah, bah. Question from AD. How do you know when it's safe to share things about your past relationships? We shared it on the first, for our our first date, we even talked about our past well, relationships. So the way I did things, you know, prior to Jonathan, in fact, when we met, 
that's what you didn't like that all I did was talk about about my life and my relationships because the way I thought it would be is like I'm just gonna tell them everything here it is um well what and, but you didn't like you were gonna interrupt me <laughs> I stopped. I stopped. <laughs> you didn't like that I didn't ask you questions. Yeah. Uh, well, but you didn't ask me questions. I just sure I opened the door with questions. Tell me about your past relationships. Oh, okay. So I well, I, I think if you remember, I what do I do all day long is I ask questions. So yeah. so what I didn't appreciate was I know you felt you would lay your cards on the table. What I didn't appreciate is you didn't try to extract that information from me. Okay. So, well, we I got over that. I didn't know how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so now we were, you're more intentional about that. Yeah. Coming back to this person's question, when is it safe? Well, here's the thing we have to think about the word safe. Okay. Are we talking about, are there things that you might share that might be a secret and wouldn't, you wouldn't want public? That's one way of looking at it. Or are we talking about safe is sharing something that might cause a man to run the other way? Okay, so let's look at it from those two prisms. Um, you know, men are territorial. So we don't typically want to know about your past relationships. In fact, in some ways, that's that may not be healthy because men avoid, on some level, they want to like almost be ambivalent, not ambivalent. Um, they almost want to block out that you've ever slept with another man because we want you to all be virgins. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, that's, I mean, men operate that way. We're territorial. I think the importance is when you're with an emotional grown up, sharing about your past gives you a window on how they would operate in the future to some degree. You know, like hearing about your past marriage and your significant relationship, I got the sense of who you were as mm -hmm. you gave me a kind of a, I, I got the sense that you're a loyal, trustworthy person based on sharing your past relationship. I think by me being vulnerable and sharing my past did the same for you. Mm -hmm. um, that may not be true for everyone because not everyone is an emotional grown up. I mean, the reality is, is we're dealing with emotionally dysfunctional people most of the time. So whether it's safe or not, you know, the, you have to feel safe within yourself and recognize that whatever you share, if it's sincere and from the heart, you can't scare away the right guy. Anything to add? Nope. Okay. Said. Okay. Thank you. All right, let's go to Rika. Question. Uh, dated in the past three months and NC one year. I don't know what NC is. Now in biz together. He has a baby mama. I sense he has plans of having me romantically, but we remain professional. Is it sensible to ask him about this? So, oh, folks, I'm really, I'm all about cut to the chase, okay? This game of like playing cat and mouse and, you know, playing hard to get or, you know, playing the field, whatever you're playing. I'm like, look, do you like me? Do you want to explore a relationship with me? Are you interested in getting married or living with someone? If so, what does commitment look like for you? I prefer you set the rules of engagement in the beginning. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Well, do you agree with me on this? I, I do. I do. Well, that's I do. I put all my expectations out there. When we, yeah. well, well, after the sec, after the first conversation. Second oh, okay. Time. Are we talking about the time we talked on the phone or when we physically met? Mm, gosh, it's all a blur now. I think probably when we met. Okay, yeah. only because I felt like I put all my expectations on the table. <laughs> and you kind of, well, I think, okay, why I was taken aback by it, I think in my case, because I was reluctant to explore distance, I put my car, I put my expectate, not expectations, but my stand, my desires up front. And you seem to mirror my desires. So, I mean, it was kind of like we were a mirror of one another. That's how it felt. Does it make sense? Or I mean, does that feel true? It was a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> okay. So coming back to do this, just, just be upfront. I like you. Or do you like me? 
do you want to explore a relationship with me? It, are you, what does commitment look like for you? And this is what I desire. And if it makes sense, let's explore it. That's my way of looking at it. All right, great. Uh, Weijin writes, hello, you two. Jonathan looks great, but Marie, you look drop dead gorgeous tonight. You are Aww, drop dead gorgeous. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that. LG says, I listened to the audiobook of Attached on, on Tube. It's excellent. Yes, you can look it up on YouTube as well. All right, uh, let's find another question. Weijin wrote, I love Officer and a Gentleman. Thank you so much. Oh, Melanie has a part two to that. By the way, I took the engagement ring back during argument. Now he says he doesn't want to lose me. Please just ordered your book for us to read. Okay, I want you to read another book together. If you're going to at least make an investment in one another, oops, a little different when I'm, I want you to read the book, Eight Dates by Drs. John and Julie Gottman. This will outline, literally it will be your outline for the conversations to have to determine if you're truly compatible with one another. The Gottman Institute, I'd also, everyone Google the Gottman Institute. John and Julie Gottman are experts at predicting relationship success. And in fact, I believe they have a 95%. They, in 15 minutes, can meet with a couple and within, within that 15 minutes determine with a 95% success rate whether that couple will make it or not. Like, that's how good they are at this, by just watching a couple for 15 minutes. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> why, aren't, why aren't they everywhere? <laughs> yeah, they are everywhere. Over 30,000 couples they've uh, counseled. And so the Gottman Institute, check out the book, Eight Dates, okay? Oh, uh, Joyce, can you read what Joyce just said? Jonathan, you seem like a new man with your beautiful girlfriend. You found love. <laughs> Aw, well, I do feel very grateful that she's in my life. So thank you so much, Joyce. I appreciate that. Uh, Margaret says, I Hear You is a great book. Again, I Hear You by Michael Sorensen. Let's check out what Rita says. Rita writes, question, how would you recommend to meet quality men? I'm 35. Online doesn't seem to be my thing. Would appreciate Marie's advice here. Well, you're 35. You're young. You can go out with friends. You can uh, join clubs. You can play sports, you you know, softball leagues, whatever. Those are good ways of meeting people. Um, a lot of, you know, church groups, if you're into that, um, a lot of places. But the truth is, you're cast, you cast a wider net if you're on online, except you really do have to learn how to sift out the people you don't want. Who teaches how to sift out? He does. <laughs> um, I did a really good job. I did a really good job. You did it. You know, I it's interesting, really folks. Job. Marie learned, I, I think, some through School of Hard Knocks. I think that year of trying to get those $1,000 shoes really quickly. <laughs> well, do you want to tell the story real quick and well, hang into the bar? Okay. In Chicago, there, there was, you know, they're going to reopen, actually. Okay. Tavern on Rush on Monday nights, they used to raffle off Christian Louboutin shoes. And so... I would go there with my girlfriends and it was, it was fun and it was full of men. A lot, most of them were, you know, conventions or whatever, but it was just full. And I learned that the guys that rely on their looks, those are the ones that I didn't want to talk to because that's all, you know, they came like Guidos and you know, <laughs> I, I don't know, but the just nice guys that would come up and just talk, I just found much, you know, they were much more engaging, much more interesting. Um, were they people that I, I, I never went out with anybody. But you there. told me though, by that interaction with men, like every week there was almost a new yeah. guy, you, you shared with me that you got a sense of how to read men Yeah, like, through that experience. I could see a guy, across the room and know that he was going to come over and he was going to be exactly like I thought it was going to be. And I hate saying that I was making this judgment, but I saw that so much that, you know, and they, they come out and let me buy you a drink. Hey, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and that to me was the biggest turnoff. So 
With that, though, you learned a skill. Again, this is what I teach, and I'm putting the odds in your favor, is the skill to read men. You kind mm -hmm. of learn how to pick men who are serious versus the ones who are going to waste your time. Correct. That's not everybody has learned that skill. That's a really, that's a, that's a skill like learning how to play the piano or learning how to play the guitar. That's a yeah. skill that you did through repetition over and over and over well, again. And that's something that it. I had to learn. So for those of you that don't know, I was married for 25 years and then had a significant relationship immediately after that. So when I found myself single, I, you know, I had to learn how to be single. I'd never been single. I got, I was engaged at 19. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, you don't know yourself, much less what you want at that age. But, you know, I have four kids, married 25 years. And now, you know, as an adult, I, you know, in my late forties, I had to go out and, and learn. So the naked divorce, naked recovery, mm -hmm in addition to learning how to vet men, prepared you for, I hope this is the best relationship you ever had, have. I he was want, like, he you, wants a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> you know me all too well. Yes. Okay, thank you. So coming back to your question, Rita, online dating actually is the number one place. And what I mean is over 50% of all new relationships is happening online. So as Marie said, casting the net is wide, or in my, what I always say, you know, all the spokes in the wheel do, because the reality is this, I know women who stay at home going, why aren't men asking me out? And I'm like, cause they don't know you exist. You have to be either physically in their presence or virtually in their presence to be asked out on a date. That's the reality of life because magic fairy dust isn't going to make Prince Charming show at your doorstep. Maybe the burglar who comes and steals your TV might be a possible <laughs> candidate, but I doubt it. So Rita, I wouldn't discount online dating, but I hope you take Marie's advice. You're 35. You've got, you're young. Um, as we age, now, by the way, it gets a lot harder. It gets a lot harder <laughs> because now it's the same. You see the same people on the dating apps. Sadly, so, though. Yeah. But okay. Good luck to you. Thank you so much. All right. We're going to take one more question before we wrap up. Stacy says, you both are wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank we you. appreciate it. Here's, uh, let's see. Um, Regent said, would you post pin your rules of engagement. Folks, rules of engagement is what I teach in my private coaching. So if you need help with that right here, jonathanasley.com forward slash coaching, schedule a discovery call with me to see if working with a coach is right for you. All right. I think this might be the last couple of questions for the night. If a guy comes across negative on a dating app, is that an immediate red flag? Uh, for me, it would be. So red flag to me, is different than a deal breaker. So is that a deal breaker for you? Is that a, now, now to me, red flag means ask questions. Well, it depends on how much conversation you've had, but. No, know. it's just the, the profile is negative. Oh, I hate no. liars. I hate cheaters. I hate entitled women. I hate gold diggers. I hate, you know, uh, whatever. Okay. You know, I can't stand women's profiles that lead with all their, I don't want, I don't want flakes. I don't want narcissists. I, I mean, like, and to me, those are the women who attract them all. Guess what? By the way, be grateful for the women who ask for what they don't want, because guess what? The universe keeps sending them all those people. So ask for what you do want. Again, this is what I teach in yeah. my private coaching. I just worked with a client earlier today. She wrote a beautiful illustration of her perfect relationship that went, she said it was beyond her wildest dreams, our exercise that we did together. And she feels so secure now that the right guy is literally around the corner. So focus on what you do want. If the person says what they don't want or it's negative, I always think of the Ariana, Ariana Grande song, Next. <laughs> or as Forrest Gump said, or in the movie, Run, Forrest, Run. All right, here's a question from Debbie. How can a man commit when he's had four failed marriages? So 
He committed four times. <laughs> the question is, how can a man have a successful, happy, healthy relationship? That would be a question. So it's not about commitment. He's made the commitment to marry four times. Um, the real question is, is he an emotional grown up? Has he met someone who shares his values? Is the person he's with lifestyles matching with one another? But more importantly, Debbie, who gives a fuck what this man does? You should be focused on what, I know you didn't like the F word. Uh, you should be focused on what you want. Ladies, stop caring what men want and focus on what you want. Add anything? Well, he's been married four times, four failed marriages. So I just, you know, I, I tend to give people the benefit of the doubt and until I get to know them and then, you know. Well, I think of the word failed marriage. Well, it because they're really just four marriages that, that ended. ended exactly. Okay. So the first marriage may have been he was eighteen. Okay. Yeah. Then it, you know you you was don't. Was your know. first marriage a failure? No. Okay. No, it ended because I just couldn't live that way. Anymore. Okay. So yeah. I look at my marriage as not a failure. I mean, I look at my behavior, and I wasn't mature enough to be in a significant relationship. I don't think we were a good. In fact, we went to therapy, and the therapist said you didn't seem like a good fit with one another right from the get go, and that was true. So I don't look at that as a failure. I look at it as an ending. Um. And the real question is, can we learn from our past relationships? So in this particular case, um, first off, again, who cares if, you know, whether he can commit or not? What really matters is, can you commit and choosing a person that can commit? Now, my guess is she asked that question because she's <laughs> with a man who's been four marriages that ended. Um, radical honesty, rules of engagement, laying your cards on the table. Um, that would help in this scenario. Um, Okay, it's an hour past. You want to wrap up or are you willing to go a little further? I, whatever you want. Okay. okay. Good. You're so easygoing. Sherry says, confused. Um, should you be a giving... Wait. Wait. Should you be a giving narc all of your vulnerable points in the beginning? Heck, takes 90 days to figure out if they're a narc. Uh, I think she means a narcissist. narcissist. Okay. Should you be... Okay. You know, I believe clinical narcissist represents less than 5% of the population first, okay? And I believe it's either clinical narcissist. Mm -hmm. Now, with that said, I would venture to say 60 to 70% of the population, men and women, okay? Let's, let's be clear. This is men and women are self-centric. Self-centric means they're they're, they're focused on their own needs and not necessarily a giver. Okay. So with that said. Narcissistic tendencies though. Well, there are some gaslighting. There are some, you know, dismissing of feelings. There's certainly turning things around, self-centric. But, you know, all humans have that capacity. I mean, even I've gaslighted you before. Not intentionally. It's just we saw things differently. And, and we can call that, you know, a lot of times... The, this terminology gets misused, but you well, have something to say. I think the internet has created a generation of narcissists. Mm -hmm. Well, really very self-centric people. Very, you know, the, all the, you know, the posing and the pictures and trying to get attention. Everybody wants attention. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Men and women. So the question is laying your cards on the table in the first 90 days. You know, you know, you know, here's the tricky part. Um, it's look at listen, men are oftentimes driven by sex, they're love bombing, that sort of thing. Okay, that's a true experience to have out there. You can experience people are narcissistic. What's most important is narcissists typically choose weak people, that they tend to choose weaker people, okay? They're, they're not, you know, what I mean is, and that's just, that's not Jonathan's words, that's what I've read. They choose to choose, they tend to choose people that don't have enough self-worth, self-esteem, and self-respect. 
Okay. So if you operate from a place of self-respect, self-worth, self-confidence, you'll probably energetically repel narcissists anyway. Okay. Um, but and her question is, should she, you know, express all her vulnerability well, to somebody like that? And my, well, she, my if she knows would, it is, no, absolutely my answer not. Would be but no. if you don't know he's a narcissist yet. So I like what Matthew Hussey says, you invest and then you test. And what that means is you invest a little bit and see how he responds. And then you invest a little more and see how he responds. Now, could you end up with someone who's a sociopath and a narcissist? Yes, that's part of the gamble. But just remember, don't give your power away to a man. If you are in your sovereignty, your self-worth, your self-respect, you will always be able to walk away from somebody who's self-centric with your chin high because you don't give your power away to another person. And what I mean by giving your power away, women, you know, Marie, women have a tendency. I'm going to read this for everyone. Women have a, this was seven ways women give their power away. The relationship is on his terms. You abandon your standards and boundaries. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's giving your power away. You're afraid to speak your truth with him. That's giving your power away. When the relationship ends, all you do is focus on him, him, him instead of yourself. Make a divorce. That's giving your power away. You're mm -hmm. waiting for him to initiate contact all the time. That's giving your power away. We took turns initiating contact mm -hmm. in the beginning. You stop doing your pre-relationship life, you know, whatever you did before because of him. That's giving your power away. You're feeling like you can't live without him. That's giving your power away. You think the other person is the only person in the universe that will make you happy. That's giving your power away. Listen, you can, listen, love is a risk. Putting yourself out there is a risk. So I would invest a little and see how he operates. But if he turns out to be a narc in 90 days, you walk away with your head high knowing that you didn't give your power to this person. Can I please get an amen from people? <laughs> well, true narcissists though, you don't know they're narcissists right in the beginning. Yeah. They're, they're gonna love bomb you, they're gonna be perfect, everything's gonna be great. And then little by little, they start taking your power away. But so. love bombing is the first clue yeah. that they're a narcissist. Folks, when a guy overly expresses love, when he overly expresses appreciation, when he overly expresses being into you, that's a sign that you are being what's called love bombed. And if you don't know what love bombing is, do me a favor, type it into YouTube. There's about 42 million videos to give you some clues. A healthy relationship is built on mutual respect and mutual effort. You know, of course I complimented you. I still to this day compliment you every day, but it's not excessive. I'm mm -hmm. not, ex people that are excessive are oftentimes can turn out to be narcissists. Um, refrigerator. Oh yeah. The guy with the refrigerator, but we can talk about yeah, that. Yeah, we, we talked about it. All right. Yeah, you know what, true. Sherry, thank you so much for that question. Oh, this will be the, this will be the second to the last question. Read it. Question, what sign is Marie? I know you're a Leo, off topic, I know. I'm a Gemini. <laughs> Schizophrenic, you just hit the camera. I know, I just hit the camera, sorry. <laughs> so you, she's a Gemini, I'm, I'm a, Gemini. a Leo. Does that make us a good, in my last relationship my was friends, a Gem my Gemini. Friends, my good friends have been Leos. Okay, my kids were Gemini, or are Gemini, I should yeah. say. So, okay, I must like Gemini's. This will be the last question. It's a personal question for the both of you. Um, that is not deep. What have been your favorite places to travel to? Well, I've done a lot more traveling than Are Jonathan. Ready to talk about what we've done together or separately? So why don't we do both? We'll answer okay. the together and do, answer separately. What's your favorite place you've been to? Well, I like different places for different reasons, but okay. you know, like diving in the Maldives, you can't beat that or, mm. or the Great Barrier Reef, you know, okay. that. but um together well we've been we've been, to, we've been on nothing but mexico we did cancun we did the panama canal cruise we did the uh mexican riviera cruise we're uh, just getting started we went to chicago <laughs> we went to uh vegas um i really like going through the panama canal yeah i thought that and i love going to and your that, home city cartagena cartagena yeah. 
Say yeah. wait, say it properly. Cartagena. Cartagena. <laughs> I no Panama Canal. I had never gone through the Panama Canal, so that's the first thing. That's one of the things that we did together. Yeah, that was a that great I experience. Never, I had never done. Yeah. But and there's, you know, there's still a lot of places to see. We're gonna go to <laughs> Peru. We're gonna go to the Mediterranean. My favorite place to answer your question. I really liked Paris with my son, yeah, but I was Paris. with my son. So I loved Amsterdam, but again, Love I was, Amsterdam. so it was also the person you're with, I think makes a big difference, not just the place, but who you're with makes, at least for me, made a big difference. So yeah, Catherine, I've done stuff solo and it's great too. Okay. So. You know, yeah. folks, I, we got so many, oh my God, look at all this. Um, let's see. Well, this will be the last one. Marie, which cruise line did you use for your solo cruising? If I may ask. Um, I've done Norwegian because they, Norwegian cruise line, and they have like a solo person that, that kind of connects you with other solo travelers. And now I haven't done that in a long time. Now they have, um, they have solo cabins that are inside cabins that, you know, people like them. I just don't like being inside, but, uh, by the way, we are doing Virgin for New Year's Eve in the Caribbean, and I'm really excited because Virgin seems like an amazing cruise yeah. line. So, and it's adult only. Adult only. So, if yeah. you want, if you're if you're tired of kids on cruise ships, check out Virgin. <laughs> All right, uh, Sia says Leo and Gemini's go well together. That's good to hear. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh my someone... gosh, you guys must like us. <laughs> <laughs> cool air and fire go good together. Thank you. All right. Weijin says, uh, I had a love bomber. I never knew what a narc was. <laughs> uh, let's see. A couple people say amen. Folks, we want to thank you so much for joining us today. We both appreciate you. I hope that you got value from this conversation. I just want to remind you that men don't suddenly commit. They commit when they're ready and when they've actually found that partner that they can have a deep connection with through vulnerability, authenticity, and transparency. I hope you found value in this video. If you did, please hit that thumbs up button, please, or hit that like button. Please share this video. Please subscribe to my channel. Um, if you need some support, check out in the description, in the description of this video, you can click to check, schedule a discovery call with me to check out my group, to check out the books, or even follow me on Instagram. I post pictures of Marie there. Um, do you have anything to add before we wrap up? No, I'm having fun with this. <laughs> well, I am <laughs> grateful to have you on. So I'm going to wrap up this video as I always do when my sweetheart's on. Can I give you a big, gigantic Jonathan Bear hug? Can I get one back? Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you all, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Be well. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye now.